Okay, item one, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? I'd like to add 5F of recognition. Uh, and item two, approval of the school board minutes. May I have a motion? David? I move that we approve uh, the school board minutes as set forth in a packet and inscribed in uh, paragraph 2A through D. <clears throat> Any discussion? All those in favor? All right, item three, comments by student representatives. I think we have one who is going to be with us shortly. Yeah, Abby is going to be late. Okay. Nolan? Um, so I guess I'll start off. Um, right now, spring sports are um, wrapping up, and AP tests are as well. Um, so coming to the end of a very uh, stressful period of time for a lot of the uh, upperclassmen. Also, prom is this weekend uh, at the Portland Club. It's a Casino Royale theme. Um, and today, uh, in the, ca in the um, gym, actually, we had uh, voting on the proposed budget. Um, and for seniors, we've been uh, working on our, our STP research and, and the whole process with that. And what the STP is for uh, the members of the public who don't know is it's a, um, it stands for Senior Transition Project. And it's a project where uh, seniors will, will go into, into the community and or into the workforce. And basically, they'll shadow somebody at a job or uh, a, a field that they're interested in uh, in order to gain a little insight uh, as to what that career might be like. And then at the end, there's a presentation. Um, a lot of seniors also uh, just finished up with their senior to senior. Um, uh, senior to senior, uh, I guess, project is that's something where seniors will um, help out uh, elderly members of the community with things like yard work. Um, <coughs> And, and anything they might need. It's a really, really a great program, and it was uh, a lot of fun. Um, also, uh, upper or seniors have three days left of school, so that's definitely exciting, three days left of classes. Um, and so right now, the, uh, the main focus uh, for us is just graduation plans, and that's kind of what the, the student council, uh, at least the seniors, are focusing on right now. Um, the sophomores are, are working hard. Uh, raising money already for their their prom they've already got it pretty well planned out um, they're uh, definitely a very very organized group um, also the art show um, uh, students art from uh, throughout the entire years is, is right now being shown in the gym lobby um, so if you haven't seen that you should uh, get down there and check it out it's definitely there's some really impressive art there um, uh, photography ceramics and painting and drawing things like that um, Definitely some great stuff down there, too. Thank you. Any questions for Nolan? Uh, can I just add that I, I did view all the there's photographs, there's paintings, there's ceramics. It is really impressive. OK. Um, item four is comments from the public on agenda items. We have a lot of people in the room tonight is unusual for us. Um, if anyone has comments on items that are on our agenda tonight, um, this is the opportunity to stand up and, and speak. OK, seeing none, we will move on to item 5A, communications. And we have um, a legislative sentiment. And I believe Senator Rebecca Millett is here. Um, and uh, the speech team is here. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you, as always. It's always great to be here. It's, yes, a refreshing change from my usual environ. <laughs> Um, and I know you are all going to laugh, as those of you who know me well, that I'm going to read something from, yes, my smartphone. <laughs> when did you get a cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> um, shorter than normal. So, um, 
I, we were so looking forward to having the speech team come up and join us in Augusta, but I recognize that it's very hard to um, organize and, and coordinate schedules for such an active um, and um, large group of, of wonderful students. So um, I'm going to take this opportunity, if it's okay, with the board to actually read what I was going to say on the Senate floor. And then imagine, if you will, all these people who speechify on a regular basis, standing up and applauding you and you rising and accepting their, their greetings. So um, I stand today to recognize the Cape Elizabeth High School speech team. As we all know, as members of the Maine State Senate, public speaking is an important skill in life. A well-given speech can be powerful. It can move masses to action. It can change someone's mind. It may even be remembered and quoted throughout history. For some, this ability is natural. For others, it takes years of hard work and practice. Whatever the case is for the students of the Cape Elizabeth High School speech team, we could all take t tips from them. This year, the team won its fourth consecutive high school state speech championship. This is particularly noteworthy because in 2008, due to school budget constraints, Cape Elizabeth High School was set to lose both its speech and debate teams. Luckily, the speech team was reinstated and these impressive future leaders now take full advantage of the opportunity to compete. These students have put in hours of hours of hard work practicing the skills of speaking and in many cases overcoming stage fright. Their dedication and work ethic clearly shows in their continued success. I commend these accomplished students on their performance and wish the team and its returning members the best of luck next year. So the sentiment reads, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School speech team on its winning the 2013 Maine Forensic Association State Championship. This is the fourth year in a row that the speech team has won this title. We extend our congratulations and best wishes to the members of the team on this achievement and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. It's signed by the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, sponsored by myself and co-sponsored by Representative Hellman and Representative Monahan Derrick. So congratulations to all. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we're sorry not to go up to Augusta. Uh, the students, uh, I had a, a trick planned for the students that I had suggested that we go to a place to eat called the Red Barn. And I was going to actually take, and they were very much in objection to this. They wanted sushi uh, rather than the Red Barn <laughs> and deep uh, fried uh, food. So I was going to take them across the river uh, in the Kennebec and actually take them up to this place and, and punish them with uh, this, uh, this food. So, but we didn't get that chance. And we also missed a chance to sit in the galley uh, and uh, hear, uh, hear your uh, uh, speakers uh, up there. So thank you so much. Uh, just very, very quickly, uh, let's see. We have a photo up, up here, uh, and uh, uh, this photo uh, tells a great deal. Of course, my friend and co-coach and also debate coach is Lisa Melanson. And if you actually look at this photo, you will see another first in the state of Maine, which is a, a two people in the front. Uh, we have Nolan Chase and E.B. Neither one is here tonight, but they are holding trophies. This is the first time in the history of Maine forensics that a school won both speech and debate. So uh, kids, uh, congratulations. <clears throat> Yes, would you like to? Well, uh, I just want to send my congratulations as well, because without a dedicated student body, uh, a student team, this could not be possible. And many other classmates, I'm sure, ask you, why do you wake up at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning in the dead of winter uh, to get on a bus to Skowhegan or to Brunswick or where, uh, uh, wherever else we go? Yes. 
Uh, and the answer is, a few months down the line, uh, you have built up tremendous friendships, you have expanded your speaking skills, your repertoire of literature, and I think you know that it shows through in subtle ways in how you perform in the classroom and how you interact in your world. So I am so proud of all of you. And Thank you. And I also want to thank Mr. Mullen here, because I think you know how hard he works mm -hmm. with each one of you. Uh, and the thing about a speech team is there are 13 categories, 13 specialties that you can have, whether it's uh, poetry reading, prose reading, uh, duo interpretation, ensemble, extemporaneous speaking on uh, current events. Uh, there are numerous categories, and that takes work with each individual's material. So it's not a group practice. Uh, it is very individualized. And Mr. Mullen has set up the team in a way that we bring in um, volunteers from the community. We have David Campbell, a former parent, a parent of a former student, uh, who works with us on a daily, uh, weekly basis. We have Cindy Stephanus, parent of a, a graduate as well. She has worked with us for years now. Uh, and the four of us really um, have worked with all of you. So. So in the interest of this being about students and their uh, abilities and their speaking, uh, we're going to, it's kind of like a field of dreams trope uh, here, that we have four seniors here, I believe, who uh, were a part of the team four years ago, and I'm <laughs> going to just ask them to uh, uh, step forward like the field of dreams coming uh, through the corn, and then we'll have all the other students uh, stand up, but let's let the seniors just uh, step forward. And uh, let's see if in, what is it, 15 seconds they have, just, you can do it right out here, uh, okay, right out here, and just talk to the uh, uh, people face to face, no cell phone, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> okay, no laptop, but uh, who they are and just what they have done over the uh, years, their, their events, and there are 13 of them. So go ahead, Griffin. All right, uh, I'm Griffin Carpenter, and uh, over the course of my four years in speech, I have done poetry, prose, dramatic interpretation, and ensemble categories. My name is Ina Delsek, and over the last, over the three years that I took part in speech, I did extemporaneous speech, duo, ensemble, prose, and poetry. And I'm Doug. And these were uh, some of our leaders this year. The funniest man uh, among high school students is on the end here, Sam Barksdale, <laughs> who is writing a uh, part of writing our satire, which is going to be in a couple of uh, weeks. But these are highly accomplished uh, students. So let's have all the other students stand up, uh, please. Uh, mm -hmm. And a round of applause. And uh, thanks so much, and thanks for five years ago uh, finding the wherewithal to pull us back from uh, the grave so that we could uh, live again. We're very uh, happy with the support that you give us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Millett. <coughs> and we're going to leave because we have uh, some things. Yeah. Thank you. Well, congratulations you. to you all on your championships, and, and I know you put an enormous amount of work into, into making that happen, so well done. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, there goes more events. This seems more normal, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Moving on, then we have item 5B.
uh, presentation of the district's technology plan. One moment while I set up my technology. Okay. <laughs> well, this way you better be able to set it up. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Hope it works. So I've put together a little bit of information for you um, that extends beyond the documents that uh, are online that we've uh, developed as a committee. So if you look behind you, you may see some things. Um, thank you for giving me the time to present our technology plan that we've created as a committee. Um, I'll introduce some of the members, and, and some of them are actually here in the room. And uh, it was a very large committee, so many of them are not. Um, and we'll go through that list and everything. Um, to start with, I just want to introduce um, some of the resources that we used. There, there are a ton of resources out there for implementing a technology plan, for, for getting your materials together and, and um, providing some guidance in the plan and everything. Um, we, uh, came across uh, a resource uh, as part of digitallearningday.org. You see a, a graphic up here. Let's see if I can size that a little bit better. Um, and this is a, a graphic that kind of encompasses uh, a lot of the parts of our planning as we went through it. Um, unfortunately, the plan that we're uh, n by necessity creating is not following as a uh, encompassing a view as what you see in the, in the graphic there. You see how the, um, this graphic has a bit of a, of a flow to it with the uh, arrows um, hitting on different points of, uh, of implementation and whatnot. And uh, notice in the center there's the student learning. Um, we kind of used this and the encompassing ideas as our guidance, um, but unfortunately we had to fit it into the structure of the plan, which is about 10 years old and isn't quite as forward thinking as, uh, and as uh, present as, as something like this. So the tech plan itself um, is available on the website. Uh, I believe it'll be linked up shortly. Um, if you're interested in the address, it's on sites.google.com slash a slash capeelizabethschools.org slash tech plan 2013 2016. And those of you who are watching the video, you can rewind and replay that again. Or you can look very closely at it or watch the website, it'll come up shortly. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the tech plan has 14 points to it listed on the side over here. Um, those points are community and parent parental involvement, um, a vision, the goals, make those a little bigger. Um, to identify the necessary technology, um, collaboration with adult literacy services providers, uh, strategies for improving academic achievement and uh, teaching effectiveness, integration for technology with curricula, instruction and assessment, technology types and cost, coordination with funding resources, supporting resources, steps to increase accessibility, promotion of various curricula and teaching strategies that integrate technology, professional development, innovative delivery strategies, and uh, accountability measures. Um, again. The website is, is being completed. The full document is linked at the bottom here. And so if you'd like, you can access that and uh, take a look at the full document, all 14 points in there. Uh, just to introduce it again a little bit, what the, the technology plan is about uh, then. The technology plan, again, is required by the state of Maine and required also for us to receive E-rate services. Um, that provides a, a bit of a, of a um, income for us, as we may have seen in our budget. Um, it amounts to uh, around $15,000, $15, excuse me, that comes back to us from our service providers. And primarily for us, that's our cell phone, our land phone, and the third one is our, um, do you remember the top of the third one? Mostly communication aspects. Um, it used to be our internet service provide, providing, but uh, because we no longer uh, pay for our internet services. Um, those are paid through MSLN, and they um, take care of those costs, and so they actually um, capture those E-rate funds directly. So we don't. We get a lot of money back from these. It's a very important thing that we do. Um, unfortunately, again, the plan and the structure of it is designed back in 2002, and so it's uh, it's kind of an old structure that we're working in. 
Uh, that said, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the people that helped get us through this process. It was quite a long process. Uh, we started back in uh, November, I believe it was, was our first meeting. And uh, with a large committee, as you see in the list of names there, there's uh, several principals. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, other principals who are involved. Uh, thank you to our, our teachers. Thank you to uh, Kate on the school board here, who was uh, instrumental and well as seeing the process along. Um, these people were, were, their input was really invaluable. Um, and in particular, I don't, oh, I believe he's on the next page, excuse me. Jay Sherma as well um, was uh, instrumental in, um, in providing the uh, voice of the Thomas Memorial Library. Uh, given that some of our services interweave with Thomas Memorial Library, and it's important that uh, his voice, and actually uh, you'll see the name and specifics detailed about Thomas Memorial Library as well through the plans. Uh, generally speaking, then, uh, if we just go through a couple of these, and I won't belabor too many of the details because it gets into lots of tables and details like that which get a little dry and boring. I don't have any fun student presentations to include, I'm sorry. Um, nothing as exciting as that. Uh, but the, the, the vision that we have, the, it encompasses the same vision that the school district has. Um, we restated the same um, four core um, components there, the community, academics, passion, and ethics. Um, there, it was very easy to, to encompass technology in those vision points. Um, as we found as we went through the process and, and again, accessed our the, the re current resources, um, we're finding that the technology is no longer a skin to our actions and our purposes and our, our, our daily activities in the education world. It's really become more and more a part of our skeleton of what we do and how we do things. Um, when you look at things like individualized learning and, um, and uh, assessment and some of those kind of things, you really can't do it anymore without technology. You, you just don't, teachers can't access the depth of understanding of, of what their students are up to. The students can't access the information. The it, education is very difficult to take place with, in our current culture without technology. So it's becoming just it, it, instrumental throughout our practices. Um, and it was, again, given our structure, it was a little difficult to communicate that, but, but that's part of what we were finding there. And uh, I think it, it's highlighted really well in our vision and how easily the vision translates into um, the, the, Im the importance of technology and how it um, connects to all points. Um, mention. A couple other uh, aspects that may be useful for us in our discussion um, is some of the changes that we've seen in our budget and the staffing changes that we've seen um, were part of those came out of our uh, development of this plan. In particular, our changing from our professional development um, model and the technology integrators that we have developed over the years. It was interesting to look at the prior version of this document that was from 2009, 2010, and the talk at that point and in, in that um, document was about how we finally got three technology integrators, one per school, and now in this year, then we're looking at we're um, writing into our budget and, and hoping to implement the uh, the conversion of those those three technology integrator positions into an even more incorporated professional level position uh, um, at the literacy or library and instructional technology service um, uh, specialist at the middle school and the high school and the technology teacher formalized as a full teaching position as opposed to an ed tech position as it has been in the past. Um, so those are reflective of some of the the vision and the. Uh, plan that we're putting in place with with this technology plan. Let's see if there are other goals. I don't have much else to highlight to say. Um, again, reading through the details, you can look at some of the, the pieces in there. Um, if you'd like a little bit of time to read through them yourselves, if you have your own device, you can go to the website if you haven't had a chance to look at it already. Um, and uh, I, I, if you have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any that you have.
questions for Mr. Kramer? I actually do have questions, but they're about the MILTI program. Yes. And I'm wondering if the district has made a decision one way or the other, whether iPads or HPs? Yes, we've, we've decided to go with the iPads as our future direction for um, implementing one-to-one -one technology. Uh, we've, we've been seeing the development of them in the high school. Uh, we see success there and developing continued development success there. Uh, we see that as, uh, as the future direction of computing as well in general. Um, a laptop, you may notice I'm presenting with a laptop currently. I had a lot that I was working on up until this presentation, and, and uh, so in some cases that is a necessary device. Um, but I, at this point, I could just as easily be presenting with my iPad and, and showing all these documents and everything. And, and I I've, I've did half of the editing of this on my iPad in our meetings, and Kate can attest to this. There were sometimes uh, people who came and, and you know, didn't bring a device with them, and I had an extra one, and I handed it to them and said, here we go, because I'm not printing out papers for everybody. You may have noticed I didn't hand you a stack of 44-page uh, document, um, as this one is, to print out and hand to you and say, please look at this. If you need it to print it, then yes, go ahead. But, uh, but digital, it, the way the technology is going is into mobile devices, it's into to, uh, thin client-like devices that have still access to all the resources of the web. Um, there's still great creative tools and the like, um, and we foresee it as an exciting movement um, for the future. Great. We're also very excited that uh, it is an open option that is not just available for, uh, for districts who've worked really hard, as we have in the high school, to create a one-to-one -one environment with iPads. We had to do that all on our, all our own, and we're finally moving out of this island state and now into a, a place where we'll have cohorts, not only within our district, we'll have our middle school and our high school teachers actually being able to talk about the same kind of implementation of technology, but there are also districts in the neighboring areas that, um, as I understand, will also be moving to iPads as their choice for implementation, and so it's, a, it's an exciting move forward, um, and that's probably how we chose that. I have a question. Do you foresee, it, right now teachers have laptops mm -hmm. and administrators have laptops. Do you foresee them changing to the iPads or the, will they always have laptops? The implementation model for, for the, the implementation model will be very similar to the high school where all teachers and staff who are part of the, the implementation will have a MacBook and a iPad. Um, under the MLTI um, proposal that Apple's pr presented, then it's actually a MacBook Air, so it's a much thinner, lighter MacBook than we're used to. It's more powerful. Um, it's also um, an iPad mini, so it's more portable for the teacher, and they don't have to juggle too many big devices. Um, and for the student, it's a full iPad, um, so they have the larger screen, which is um, not only helpful for them, given it's going to be their sole device. It's also important because it's a sized, right size device for the Smarter Balance Assessment and other assessments that will be coming online. Um, and that's how the students will be accessing their assessments through the iPad. I have a follow-up question. I, I have one as well. Um, again, on the MILTI program, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if the district has made a decision on what to do with the existing 7 8 laptops? The existing MLTI laptops? Yes. Uh, we return them to the state because they aren't owned by us. The lease ends at the end of June, and uh, we return them to the state in that time frame so that uh, they, can, they can take care of them. Um, in the past, in some districts, uh, have, we will be buying back a, sh a small portion. There is an option to buy back um, part at the end of the lease is to buy out that very last portion of the lease that comes to $47 a laptop. And we are planning on buying back a select few for um, distinct implementations within the district. Um, there's a few departments that need a few laptops, um, but we aren't planning on, on buying back on a large scale. It's not enjoyable to support old technology. And yeah, can you just articulate, I mean, you get them back for $47. I, I guess I'm an articulated apparently, because <laughs> I've already begun. Uh, but you get them back for $47, but they're wiped clean. So you have to reinstall software and then, unlike under the MILTI program, when the support is provided, if, an equip if the piece of equipment fails, now you have a four-year-old laptop that's no longer supported that could consume enormous amounts of district staff time mm -hmm. um, and, uh, frankly, is not the most valuable resource that we have. I mean, we are able to use them, and they do support, you know, a fair amount of um, 
basic work, and you certainly can add to this, but they, they aren't um, the most valuable resource we have, and, and the cost benefit analysis is that it's too costly, sure. and the benefits are not that high. Good to know. I know a lot of people out there are curious about what's going to be happening with that asset moving forward. Yeah, it's not our asset to begin with, so we only get an option to buy them back if we'd like to. And again, there is that price point and the consideration that they're old devices and they no longer have any service. So what we end up doing is, even though the buyback price point is only $47, we've um, basically priced out the additional components that will be necessary to make them really feasible, usable devices. So, for example, in, the, um, in community services, they need a replacement for their um, after-school program, and they've got some laptops there that are older than four years old, I believe. They're, they're not new laptops at all. So they're going to be replacing them with bought-back MLTI devices, but those are... Um, those we will upgrade as well with their memory and their hard drive, as well as buy extra devices for servicing them if parts. And uh, so the price point ends up at about $225 per bought back laptop with those ingredients added in to make it a really um, full service kind of device that will continue to be useful in the future. Makes sense. Mary? Um, I, you haven't had an opportunity to ask a question. I thought I'd been fairly quiet. Okay. Um, I, I do have a, a follow-up question about the tablets and the usage of them. Um, I know from students, I, um, when the switch was made, there was some concern over whether they would be able to compose as efficiently on them and use them as efficiently as a laptop, and it wasn't the preference of the students. And I'm wondering, has that gotten better? I mean, as kids have used them. I think we have some students who might be able to reflect a little bit on that as well, if, if you could. Um, well, well, what I've found is that uh, the, the technology, it's, it's definitely, it has a, a certain learning curve. At the beginning, it's very easy to play games on them and very hard to do work on them. But I feel like once, once you sort of get used to it, uh, it, it can certainly be a, be a feasible learning device. I know I prefer to use a laptop, uh, but that's just me. I mean, uh, opinions certainly vary throughout the student body. Um, but I do find that at the beginning, when the iPads are first introduced, it's kind of an awkward thing to, to kind of to, to switch to, because um, you have the, the, the smaller keyboard, the, mm -hmm. the um, it's a different tactile experience, I guess, just touching a screen than it is pushing a key, um, which for some people who learned how to type on a normal keyboard, I, I guess that kind of bothers them. Um, but, but I know that opinions do vary on this. Mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, I didn't really get into the whole iPad thing. It doesn't have Play-Doh or um, it doesn't handle Google Docs very well which I'm sure they'll make improvements on in the future, but those are the two main things that you would need computers for, plus typing papers, and you can't really do that on that either. So I, like Nolan, I played a lot of games on mine. I uh, increased my score on Dragon Veil by a lot. But um, yeah, like you said, I think it works for some people. I just prefer the laptop and I just usually work in the library on the computers. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I found as well is that uh, it, some of what I'm hearing you guys talk about the, the ease of use for, uh, for playing games and for content consumption and the like versus content creation is that some of that has to do with where we're coming from as students and teachers. And the initial outset of an iPad was, was very much looking like a content consumption device. And if you use something like an a, a, um, Amazon Kindle Fire, that's even more towards the end of content consumption. I mean, they divide, designed it into, into an ecosphere where, where it's an Amazon shopping product. And that's what it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a door into the Amazon shopping world and, and that sort of stuff versus uh, an iPad, which actually has a much more extendable um, aspect to it. And some of us just haven't, haven't been introduced to it well enough. Um, uh, like, for example, you mentioned Google Drive being difficult to work with or Google, using Google 
documents to be difficult to create with. Um, that's something that even in this school year we've seen a vast improvement over the Google Drive app. I brought mine up on the, on the screen behind and um, you, can, you can do a lot more with it than you used to be able to. Not only you used to only create uh, documents, now you can create spreadsheets as well and you can edit your stuff right in there. Um, as soon as you create one it comes up and you can be typing into your cells and the like if I can get this to work. Um, the other thing we found when you have your keyboard is that some people, like you mentioned, was it, uh, there's a concern over the keyboard and, and how useful it is for text input. And this, the, the actual keyboard when you're in landscape mode is, is a little bit smaller than a full screen keyboard, but you can still touch type pretty accurately. And your, your, your touch typing speed is actually, for most of our kids, they aren't actual touch typists anyway, and so they're typing about as fast as you can finger peck anyway. Um, also, a lot, of, a lot of students find that they like to split the keyboard and thumb type as well because it's faster for them. That's how they learned with their phone. So some of those kind of tools and the like are, are built in and some, some just don't know that functionality of the iPad. Some, some of those need to be introduced more, um, I think, uh, in terms of how we're implementing them. And that's, again, like I said, about our high school's been an island and been very much alone in doing what they've been doing. And they've been doing a good job but with the resources they have, um, but knowing that we'll have a lot more support um, the, the state and Apple is providing a lot more professional development, the same professional development that's been going on with the MLTI laptops over the last 12 years will now in be also be doing with iPads and implementing that way. So I think t the teachers will be finding a lot more support, not only explicitly through that kind of professional development, but also implicitly by just having a neighbor that they can talk to that doesn't just live down the hall but also lives across the walk and across the drive and across town to the next town and so forth. And so um, I, I foresee that we'll see a lot more uplift in the expectation of what can be done on an iPad and the expectation of what gets produced in the end um, that, that, uh, that we, we haven't yet seen a lot of that, enough of that I think at this point and that's why we still um, see a lot of um, the expectations from students that, well, you know, it's good for gaming. I can highlight that, but how much can I really create on it? And it, the expectation there it just hasn't, it, it, it's, it's in development and it's, it's not as high as it can be, so, yeah. Um, I like this idea, personally. I think um, it was difficult for us as high schoolers to adjust to the iPads because we've had laptops and computers for so long. Um, but the kids that I babysit for, they know how to work with my iPad so much better than I do. And when I was doing like, work on it, I would just get frustrated and give up and go to the computer. But I feel like if you introduce them first instead of laptops, they'll be much more productive on them. Because I didn't know how to do anything on my iPad except for play games and watch Netflix. <laughs> Eric, is a, is a keyboard issued, a physical keyboard issued or, or not? Is a physical keyboard issued to students? Or? You can respond too, but I, Eric, can, you probably read the same article yesterday, but I read a, in a very brief research article where um, someone had sort of analyzed student typing on laptops, iPads with keyboards, and iPads, and straight iPads, this was third through sixth grade, had the highest words per minute. Um, for typing. So I, I, I think we are adapting to those. I think if you were to ask Nolan and Abby, because they learned on laptops, as they they're too old. They've missed yeah. the window. Well, I'm still not as fast, but I'm much yeah. faster on my iPad than I was a year ago. Yeah, the split keyboard that you saw is one reason it can be fast, just because that's what the kids are doing anyway. Um, the other reason it can be fast is because it has autocomplete built in, and your laptop usually doesn't have that. So as you type your words, it'll correct your spellings, it'll, it'll complete your words, so you start typing three or four letters, you press the space bar and you're on to the next word. So in some cases your typing speed improves because of the technology. In other cases, the technology provides an even alternative source of input. Um, with the MLTI iPads, they're, they're, they're not iPad 2s, they're iPad threes or fours, I can't remember what, they're the new iPad, and um, they support speech to text. So you can press your, your microphone key on your keyboard and start talking, and your iPad will listen, and it will translate 
and produce the text. Um, and there's, I, I, there's a little bit of work to get to do it really well, but you, know, you work on your inflection and you remember to say period or full stop and new paragraph when you need to and, and open parentheses, and, but it, you can end up being very productive without touching the keyboard. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a lot that this technology offers that a laptop can barely get to um, just because of the, the nature of the device. David? Um, I'm curious about a couple things. Um, having just received literature from a college, uh, they're recommending laptops. They'll provide you with anything, but they're recommending laptops as the preferred and, um, versus iPads. I, I have an iPad, and I have a laptop, and I even have an old desktop. Um, the concern I've always had, and one of the reasons why we did iPads was cost. You could get 90% of what you want at a much cheaper cost than you could with a, uh, a laptop. But I've always been concerned because um, we've looked at this repeatedly over every three or four years of my law firm, and we always go to laptops because of the word processing capabilities, the editing capabilities, the ability to um, uh, craft documents, which is a large... I, I guess went to your earlier point about uh, receiving data versus creating data. I, I'm curious as to, and, and I have to say that I find the word processing of, of Apple and the iPad to be inferior to that of Microsoft. And I'm curious, do you have the same view? Do you look in the future and that Apple's going to catch up? Uh, I find that I can step even further into an inferior word processing mode. And for example, this full 40 page doc, 44 page document I created in Google Docs. And I didn't use any, it was all based on online text editing. We use it as a collaborative tool so that we could work with each other in, a, in our committee. Um, we, I, I actually did the final formatting and everything in it as well. So I find that I very rarely need the power of Microsoft Office, so to speak. Um, and being in a law firm, I think, is a little bit different, the kind of document creation that you're, you're creating. Um, when you talk about text creation, I think there is an element to that in our, in our education world, and we will never escape that. And there's, you know, writing is very important. But that said, uh, to illustrate your knowledge and to, and to your understanding of things, which is a lot of what the creation process is for, for a student, is to illustrate understanding, that no longer has to be done in writing anymore. Um, it, that is one component that can be done. I think more as we move into the future, now and as we move into the future, then um, multimedia uh, presentations, um, much more interesting than what I just produced here um, with movies and, and audio clips and you know, uh, created songs that you've, you've um, composed and recorded on your device. Um, that kind of stuff is, is, is much more accessible and, and and easy to expect now. It's something that, that it's, it's at our, it, we, can, we can hit on those multiple intelligences, whereas before we were more relegated to what can you produce with a keyboard or what can you produce with your note cards and your, your, your pen and pencil. And th what you can produce now with such a mobile device as this where you can go out to your backyard and record the stream flow directly onto your iPad and then go and look up the fish that's going to be swimming in that stream and then create a movie out of it. And you're doing that all with this device sitting on your lawn chair in your backyard. That, that kind of workflow um, is, it, it negates any problem that I see with producing long form text, which is a minor, it's becoming a more of a minor, a minor product um, in the full educational world. Um, for instances where people do need to pr produce long form text and they're struggling with what the iPad can do, then we still have the support of our computer labs of, uh, and many of our, our students we know have computers at home as well, and they may still migrate to that as their tool for producing some of that stuff. Um, but, uh, but I just, uh, it's not the future that we're, we're going to is to 40 page documents. Well, I, I'm just curious, uh, one follow up question. There does seem to be a different, and maybe it's the nature of what we do in high school, and it's been a long time since I've been in high school, but and maybe you do more, but as I said, the colleges seem to prefer laptops versus tablets. Some of them. Um, and to me, may, maybe it is the length of, 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 um, 
Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff would like to. You're bringing in the lawyer now? <laughs> You're bringing in the lawyer to argue with me? No, I just wanted to add a perspective because I see myself in a middle ground actually. And I think you actually captured it, David, um, pretty well when you started, which is if yeah, you can do with an iPad 90% of what you can do with a laptop um, for less than half the cost of what it takes to, to get a laptop, that strikes me as a pretty good trade off. Um, if we wanted to, do, to capture virtually, you know, get from 90% to 98%, uh, a far more efficient way to do it than to buy laptops would be to, if we wanted to do it, I'm not suggesting we should, would be to buy a $40 Bluetooth keyboard for everybody and, um, and you, you could get all the word processing capabilities. And then the only thing that you lose is some of the more sophisticated word, pro like Microsoft Word, you're right, formatting things within Word and, and some of the really high-end photo, Photoshop kind of work and digital kind of work. Um, but we did buy two classroom sets of um, uh, physical keyboards and they're available for teacher use and they're available for our students to sign out and they're virtually unused. Um, I, and I think a lot of kids do. They find that the iPad is a tool and just like any tool, it has pluses and minuses. It's got advantages and disadvantages. For most kids, I would venture to say, writing long, long papers, on, they probably don't do it on the iPad. They might start it on the iPad in class and then email it to themselves and then continue the work at home on a laptop or some, something like that. But uh, to me, it's, it seems like a really, really, really worthwhile trade-off. And, and it is extremely cost-effective. And the other, to me, uh, thinking through the logistics of the iPad versus the laptop, one huge advantage of the iPad, right now at least, although laptops are catching up, is the battery life of the iPad. So we give kids the power cords, the charger, charging cords at the beginning of the year, and we say, you don't need to bring those into school ever. Um, whereas still with laptops, even with batteries getting better, students would almost all every day have to kind of recharge their laptops in the middle of the day. Well, you can probably answer the, the question I'm concerned about the most. I, I do think that part of it's a function of a cost-benefit analysis, uh, which I accept. I, th I think it's better to have more kids have 90 percent than fewer kids have 98 percent. But I am concerned about some of the things that, are, I, I, as far as I can tell, a laptop, laptop can still do better. But that may be because I do do something different than what's done in high school. Are, are you convinced that for the tasks in our English class and our history classes, that the iPad does get 95% of what you want or 90% or whatever it is as it, opposed to what I do? Yeah, it, and it, it absolutely can. Um, I see Nolan has his hand up. But, but there are also, I would say, some things that you can do on the iPad that you can't do on a laptop. For example, there's an app that students use a lot called Notability. Um, where you can, you can import PDFs and annotate PDFs. You can take notes by, um, by uh, what do you call those things? Uh, I'm, Styluses, or I'm, you can I'm do it with your I'm trying, I'm trying to get the, <laughs> um, the tech people to teach me how to do that, because I already have all that, I just don't know how to yeah, do but it. But it's, it's just a fantastic app, and um, I think it's actually one of the most used by most kids, is that. I will also say that Eric and I both went to Yarmouth High School a couple of weeks ago because the state was doing, well, Apple was doing a presentation of its, its proposal, uh, which is an alternative to the HP proposal that the governor has endorsed. Um, and one of the things, in terms of the distractions in gaming, one of the things that I heard there was that there, that the, there is going to be a much more sophisticated tool available for teachers to use to control things, um, at least in the classroom. To, to sort of, and I think that will be especially, I mean, it would, it would be helpful at the high school. I think it would be especially useful if it works the way it's advertised at the middle school. Well, does that mean I can't get Clash of Clans on my uh, iPad anymore? You can, I'm you could get it. it. There's no way that, we, as I understand it, there's no way we can prevent you from getting it. Okay, good. Uh, right, no, but no. we can, I think, prevent you from using it when you're in a class. Um, we don't have that capability right now, and but there may be some capabilities coming. So sorry to, but I, no, I, I think you answered my question. Thanks. Nolan, I think, has a question. Um, well, uh, I, my, my opinion is, is that um, if you, you ask 10 out of 10 students if they want to write their essay on an iPad or a laptop, all 10 are going to say the laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and another, another 
thing I would, I mean, and that does have to do with this whole learning curve and, and a lot of people not really being used to it yet. And I believe, I believe that, will, that will come. Um, uh, another thing uh, that I would bring up is, is that you can do 90% of the same things on the iPad uh, as you can on a laptop for half the cost. I just, I don't know if students are actually doing 90% of the things that they can do on a laptop on an iPad, or they're just using it, it for like 5% of the things and the rest for games. I mean, I just I just worry about it becoming an expensive game machine. Like, I, obviously I, I wouldn't want that for this school in the future. So Mr. Shedd's, um, the thing that he heard at, at Yarmouth High School actually sounds like a really good idea because um, if teachers could kind of turn off games in the classroom, then iPads could still be used for learning and then when you go home, like if you want to, if you want to access games, you can. But yeah, that would be to be specific about what, what uh, Mr. Shedd and I heard, it's a, it's a tool that's part of the management solution that's provided through MLTVI. It's a tool called Casper Focus. So if you want to look it up, uh, Casper Focus, what it allows the teacher to do is select the students in their classroom and say, these students are now using this app. And it locks the iPads into that app. And I'm not sure if it actually disables even the ability to turn the iPad off or not. I know that in some formats of that, then you, you can actually lock that too. So the screens are on, the screens are on that one app. And the, the, uh, this, the, in, the need for it really arises not from classroom management per se, but from the need to be able to provide testing on the iPads. And if you can't lock an iPad into a testing mode, then you can't use it for testing because the, the kid could switch over to your messaging or your, whatever you want to use, Skype or uh, your FaceTime, whatever you want to use to try to talk to people or bring up a calculator when you're not supposed to have a you know, any of those sort of things. So that was the original, uh, the outset of the need for it, and yet it does happen to be a, a nice classroom management tool if you find it necessary, so specifically to that end. I think that what you're talking about in terms of the environment of where you're at is, again, that that is something that we are by necessity addressing because no, these are not gaming devices per se. These are educational devices and it turns out they're really good at some of the games that you can get on them, but that's not the intent of the device and the device is for educational purposes. We're still figuring out how we can use them well in educational purposes, and how we can use them. And that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm looking forward to seeing more and more of and our teachers and, and staff through our, throughout our district really being able to see that kind of implementation. Something that hasn't been talked about is uh, Pond Cove and um, some of the, the plan that we're, we have in place for that. Um, the general picture is that Pond Cove has a minimal amount of personal devices. Um, the middle school has, is a flush with them in seventh and eighth grade. They're all one to one, everybody there. The fifth and sixth grades teachers are well set because they're incorporated in. We've, we've added them into the same structure that this, the staff does at seventh and eighth grade. They have laptop carts, so they've got some tools available and stuff. But the same amount of laptop carts that are available for the fifth and sixth grade are also available for all of Pond Cove. And to supplement that, currently in the classrooms in Pond Cove has minimal numbers of iOS devices and other um, like kind of small personal devices that are available, but that's, um, that's a focus that we need to, to, um, to work on. Um, basically, we got to catch up the bottom there. And if you look at what uh, Auburn's doing with their kindergarten and, and the like, I'm not saying that's what we're necessarily planning to do, but the focus on including technology at that level and teaching the dig digital citizenship early and the digital literacy and really getting them on board with, with these tools are tools and you can use them for educational purposes. They're not just your gaming device. And starting that early is essential for, especially for our young kids who are coming in now because they will not be able to work without technology in the future. Like it, the world is becoming reliant on techn technology and our educational world is by necessity needing more of that technology. So. I think we have a couple more questions. Kate, did you, do you have? But I don't want to, I want to let Meredith, you sure? Oh. Um, part of the thing that was amazing about the committee was that the, having the teachers, the principals, and then uh, the library in there, the intelligence, the level of um, professionality, intelligence, and want of how to help kids get to the next level of and understanding and education and learning, so the deeper learning, was really impressive. And yeah, it was hard to go to 
a 3 to 5.30, 2.30 to 5.30 meeting every two, whatever. We had a lot of meetings when the sun was just beginning to shine. <laughs> People were there doing the work. And it was wanting always an answer to a question, so which is really exciting. Um, pretty early in the group, um, Eric, uh, this part of the things that we researched, we went through Project 24, had a MOOC. We talked about the MOOC learning um, oh, yeah. Friday. The reason why I love that, I went on and did a, a seminar, there are six of them, but it took people, so not only from Maine, but from California and Arizona, I don't think there's any international, I didn't see. I wouldn't be surprised if there were. It was open to the internet and, and it was a massive online, a massively open online course or MOOC and um, it was sponsored through the same, the same group that puts on the Digital Learning Day um, and they created it as part of their digital literacy transition project that we kind of hooked onto, for example, that gear um, uh, infographic that you saw. That's all part of this Project 24 work. The MOOC that they put together had a lot of experts and other people in, in the country who are doing this kind of stuff and who have already implemented to a higher degree that we have. Um, I was surprised to see that there weren't more of these experts from Maine, given what we've been doing already. Um, but it, needless to say, there were some really great stuff and, and I ran into several colleagues that I know across the state of Maine who are also participating and lots of people across the, the country as well. Um, and it was, it was, it was a, a, a nice resource and it's still going on. I, I have to complete units five and six myself. And I actually, I held myself back from telling all of you guys, you gotta get on this program, you gotta see, because it's what the future of education is. And so it tied into a lot of um, Education Weekly and a lot of the professional uh, magazines that we read and what um, workshops that our teachers are already going to, as well as the IS component of how we're using technology um, with to, you know, to differentiate um, our learning. So yes, my son says the same thing you guys did. Thanks for voting on a game piece for me. But the reality is our teachers want the more learning and with the move to three teachers, e uh, um, teachers for technology, even though I found Gwyneth and Jonathan, the whole team amazing, um, you know, whatever, we're just, we're getting into it and it's our future. And David, there's three times a week that all of us can go and get, um, learn for, about iPads and technology. And I, I haven't yet received permission. I prom no, I think, well, Eric gave permission and uh, it's not like Meredith to tell us we can't learn. <laughs> 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 I, I don't a box there, didn't hates she? Hates learning. <laughs> well, uh, so Eric, I have no response. <laughs> so I've got permission from her. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Michael. I know uh, which asked a lot of questions, but it's maybe this is more of a comment. I think you know uh, this may may hear terms like they're playing games, etc. But I had a lot about uh, Legos and robotics in mind. You know, children play with Legos at very early ages, but actually there's an entire curriculum that has developed around Legos, robotics engineering, <laughs> and I technology the same way. Uh, you know, it's a tool, and the challenge for the district is to build up programming and curriculum around that tool. So um, if there's more applications or apps on the iPad that are related to, you know, different course subject matters, and it'll depend on their developmental needs, but I think well, that's all districts. Challenge and opportunity is developing an overall curriculum around it, and you know, in five years, ten years, the device will be different. But our curriculum should be set so it can be used on that device. So I think this is a natural evolution of the introduction of technology, and I think um, you know the challenge the next few years and opportunity is: do we build the curriculum and maximize um, the resources we have? So I'm not. Um, Surprise, you know, people are playing games on it. If you, you know, it's depending what age, if you give a bunch of first graders Legos, they're going to play with Legos. But if you do it in a way, they're actually learning um, STEM skills. So I think that's something we'll look forward to learning more over the next few years. Yeah, and some of those games are fantastic learning opportunities, whether it's uh, Minecraft or whether it's, uh, if you know anybody who's struggling with algebra skills, um, get them Dragon Box. 
And uh, there, there are a lot of those that are out there that I don't know if they're even categorized as education, but, um, but the education world is finding them and starting to leverage them. Um, it's really a matter of how you implement them. I mean, there are, there are people who are using World of Warcraft as a way of teaching leadership skills um, as you form your, what are they called? Uh, I haven't played it myself, so I'm just speaking out as someone who's read about it. But uh, you form your units and you, and you lead them into battle and whatnot. And they're using these kind of games, which we often think of as, no, no, I would not want to see that in my school. Um, and, and yet that kind of stuff is out there and, and actually can be leveraged, but it's a matter of how you use it. And I think that's, that's what we're just starting to get to, you know, with one year of having them at the high school. And with a lot of other people joining on and doing the similar sort of stuff, I, I foresee a great advancement. Um, we're, we're, we've been leading the charge and um, we're right at the, the crest of the wave and ready to keep going. Mary? Just one um, sort of hardware question. Mm -hmm. and, um, do we still have a Mac lab in uh, Pond Cove? Yes. And will we continue to use that Mac lab or will that sort of become obsolete and replaced with tablets in your, or do you have that included in your plan? Uh, we didn't plan out, in, in, this, in this plan, we didn't plan level of detail of specific labs okay. and, and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, it, if I was pushed on the subject, I would say that we will probably maintain a lab, a, a lab in every school. Um, because of the necessary resources that it provides for, for advanced photo editing okay. And, okay. And, uh, and maybe a large-scale movie production or something like that. I think in many cases it will turn more into a studio than a lab. Okay. Um, I know that um, and I, uh, Betsy Nielsen at the high school is actually looking at, at I don't know what status she's at on that, Jeff, but in, in creating a, a, a filmmaking kind of curriculum and the sort, and, and it's stuff that you can start to do and you can do a lot of it on your portable devices nowadays. If you haven't played with iMovie on an iPad, it is an enjoyable experience. And you don't often say that about cutting movies, but it's really, in, unless you're a, a movie geek, then it's, it's really enjoyable and fun to, to slap together your little home movie and whatnot, or to take your, your exhibition of learning and put it together into a cool show where you, you throw in your own soundtrack. I mean, that's a really enjoyable kind of experience, but those labs are still going still to be useful. Um, and especially at Pond Cove, which doesn't have the access out in the classrooms yet. Um, the future direction I see for Pond Cove is that, uh, is obviously bolstering some of the, the individual devices that are out there, but also taking any that are left as an infrastructure kind of device, like the, the, the laptops on carts and stuff, and basically just outside of the lab, everything else that's been passed around and shared like that, basically actually installing them in classrooms and saying, this is, this is your technology, it sits in your classroom, have access to it. Because you don't have enough right now. There are classrooms that have one iPad. Mm -hmm. And there's not much sense in one iPad in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the teacher brings in their personal iPad and they got two. And that's just not much to go with. And so you give them four laptops and an iPad, and at least they got some grouping that they can do. You know, it's some of that kind of stuff is where we need to go with, with, and some of that we can do with the technology we have. And having a technology teacher who will be able to support that transition and stuff is going to be really important. Um, but uh, but it, in the end, we're going to need a few more devices in the, middle school, or in the elementary school anyway, um, just to bring them up to speed. We will end up with kind of an interesting conundrum where the, the middle school will have, in the fifth and sixth grade currently, they have laptop carts. Seventh through twelfth will be iPads. And there'll be a lot of iOS devices in the elementary school too. So there'll be this kind of funky middle year, which we'll have to work out as well, of why do I need a laptop? You know, they're going to have the converse um, impression that you guys are sharing of, I w I'd rather have my, my laptop. They're going to be saying, I don't want a laptop. Give me my iPad back. You know, let me, let me get that quick little keyboard. Or what. You know, so I think we're going to foresee that. I foresee that that's what we will have start to happen in our middle school in that fifth and sixth grade period. And we'll, we'll need to address that within the next couple of years as well. well Thank you. I really appreciate the, the spirit with which you're leading the district forward on, on all these fronts. Uh, and, and, and I can see, you know, the friction you're up against just, just standing here and, you know, and taking these questions. And, and, you know, I imagine that across an entire district. And, and, um, and uh, so I, I really uh, uh, value your leadership on this. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's exciting work. And as I tell everybody, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of good work because I'm working with some great people. 
So thank you. The timeline for this, if it isn't shared with you, I believe it is on the website. We do need to, uh, to pass this on to the, let me bring that up again, on to the, uh, the, the Department of Education by May 25th. So, um, so I believe we need a signature on this in some form or other, and I'm not sure what that process is. But uh, I believe before we send it up to the Department of Education, we need a little stamp of approval. If you don't mind, maybe Meredith can talk to the process on that or something. We can catch up. But again, thank you for your time. Thank you. So we are moving on to <laughs> item 5C. I really wasn't results to. And the district report card. And I didn't mean to usher poor Eric off, off the stage here, but I thought it was an opportunity to get my technology ready to go. So um, New England Common Assessment Program is has one more year left in its lifespan, and then it will be replaced by um, the Common Core Assessment, and Maine is part of the Smarter Balance Consortium. And um, as we move into next year, we'll spend some time talking about Smarter Balance and what those assessments look like. But for now, this is an opportunity to kind of reflect on our progress under NECAP for the last four years. Um, this is the fourth year that Maine has utilized the NECAP system, although um, different areas in writing in particular continue to be targeted each year. So if you try to look at continuous progress in writing, it's not terribly useful because one year you might, they might be looking at narrative pieces, and another year they might be looking at response to informational text passage that you've read. <coughs> These were the annual measurable objectives that the state of Maine set in order to meet no child left behind expectations. You can see that this year the state was expected to be at 92% in reading and 90% in mathematics. As we know, Maine requested a waiver from the federal government for no child left behind um, last year. So to be clear, level four is the highest um, performance level under the New England Common Assessment Program. It's called proficient with distinction. Level three is proficient. Level two is below proficient. And level one is substantially below proficient. So you can see in reading um, at grades three through five, 89% of our students at Pond Cove performed proficient or better, scored proficient or better on those assessments this year. And 86% uh, in mathematics, I'm combining levels three and four here as I work across, um, and 54% in writing. And writing was assessed again in fifth grade only, so you're looking at a smaller cohort sample. And again, it was a different type of writing than they've used in prior years. So, <laughs> If we look at four-year trends, and this did not align terribly well. Um, I may have to switch back here, but as we look at four-year trends, you can see, and actually you can't see, so I'm going to escape this for a minute and we'll come back. Um, but generally at Pond Cove, we've seen a four-year or four percentage point increase over the last several years. Um, going from 85% of our students scored proficient or better in um, 2009, and we're at 89% in reading achievement now in 2012. This format looks better now, so we're going to see what happens here. So I escape and reset. Go back to where we were. There we go. Um, there's, I skipped ahead. So if you, again, similar trend in math at Pond Cove for four, over four years. And remember that we're assessing different groups of students each year. So this doesn't necessarily speak to individual student patterns or patterns of a particular grade. But the real intent of this assessment is to look at school-wide patterns over time. So again, in math, we've seen a slight um, upward increase from 82% of our students scoring proficient or better in math in 2009 to 86% um, today in 2012. 
At the middle school, our scores for this year, again, 89% of our students in grades 6 through 8, because we look at students who are with us in grades 5 through 7, uh, scored proficient or better in reading. And 83% of those students scored proficient or better in mathematics. And in grade 8, which was a different type of writing being assessed, again, from what was assessed in grade 5, um, we, we also had um, a significant performance um, of 83% of our students scoring proficient or better. Again, part of what we want to know is what does this look like over time. If you look at reading trends at the middle school over time, they're fairly flat. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to us as we did the work with the literacy committee here that started before I came. What we determined was we were missing some early literacy experiences for some of our students in the elementary grades. And we began um, this past school year with the implementation of um, a phonics program in the elementary grades that's sequential and systematic. And that training has been provided for teachers and that implementation is in place. Um, our middle school teachers are also working to support students and um, provide interventions for students who aren't meeting those proficiencies. But it's not surprising to us that we haven't seen the same upward trend in grades 5 through 8. We know that the window um, where you can make the most significant impact for children is earlier. In mathematics, again, um, fairly flat performance, but our scores overall are high with 82% of our students to up to 83% this year performing proficient or better. And again, different cohorts of students in each of those years. And I will say that middle school mathematics trends nationwide, um, typically what you see over time is that in middle school student performance drops off. Um, which is an interesting trend. Usually in grades 5 through 8, you see a slight downward incline of student performance. So the um, positive news, at least in our cohorts, is that they are basically maintaining their proficiency levels, if not um, adding to those proficiency levels. So that's good news for us locally. So other things that we try to look at when we look at these assessments are not just how are we doing locally in our own schools, but where does that <laughs> put us with respect to other schools that surround us? So if we look at our scores, and this is the summative scores for grades 3 through 8 in reading, mathematics, and writing, you can see we're pretty well in the range of most of the districts that we look at as comparison districts, Yarmouth, Falmouth, and MSAD 51, which is Cumberland, North Yarmouth. Um, slight variations, again, our writing score, and particularly our fifth grade writing performance this past year was um, weaker um, than, than the performance of some of those other districts. And um, I think for us, that was a great learning opportunity about, geez, this is a type of writing we need to spend some more time on and to have more conversations with our students about. So the data is beyond, though, just looking at what's the big picture for us as a school. Um, we begin to look at cohort groups. So cohort groups might be grade level. So if we looked at um, the students who are in fifth grade this year, we can see that their reading performance increased between 2011 and 2012 by five percentage points. That's great news for us, particularly because we know we were starting to put some interventions in place with those students during this time period. So that's an early indicator that we're hopefully moving in the right direction. We can also look at gender. Um, I didn't include a particular slide for gender, but it, again, no surprise that reading performance of girls generally in grades 3 through 8 tends to um, be slightly higher than reading performance of boys in grades 3 through 8. Again, that's sort of a national phenomena, but for us, part of, part of um, the lesson to learn there is to think about um, what kinds of text we're asking students to read and respond to. And while the traditional track in um, literacy, language arts instruction has been to include more fiction and narrative-based text. We've learned as research has grown in the field that it's important to include more informational text, more historical text, more nonfiction text that appeals to um, male readers as well. Not that that doesn't appeal to female readers. Um, we can also look by subgroup, and the subgroups um, that, that our district typically sees pulled out, meaning that there's a large enough percentage of students that those are counted for sort of state and federal assessments, are students with disabilities and are economically disadvantaged subgroups. About 6% of the students in Cape Elizabeth are um, considered economically disadvantaged based on our free and reduced lunch numbers. And our students with disabilities numbers um, are roughly in the um, 10 to 12% um, range. So 
those percentages of students, and again, those are sort of known pieces to us, but those students are not performing at the same levels as their peers. And that's work that we also continue to need to focus on as a district. So those are conversations that we continue to have. And for us, we're small enough that we can look at the individual students who make up these groups and take a closer look at what interventions are in place for those students, what supports are in place, and what can we do differently for them as, as their um, teachers and instructors. And then we look at student growth. This is the 2009-2010 growth report. And I will say that part of the reason that's the slide is because when I built this slideshow two months ago, um, the state system wasn't accessible for a period of time because they were working on district report cards and some of the access wasn't functioning. So I don't have um, the most recent data in there, which was for 2010-11, which is what they based growth on. But the good news is they looked at it as part of our report card measures. So I can comment on that in a little bit. Um, again, as we looked at this last year, our students, 64% of our, 84% uh, of our students were meeting or exceeding growth expectations. So that's not, are they meeting the standards, but is it, are they as individual students achieving at a higher level, meeting or exceeding the standards that you would expect them to be based on their prior year's performance? And again, that's really great news for us, but we need to also look at the individual students who make up those groups and see if those individuals are making growth or those individuals who aren't making growth, what's getting in the way for those individuals. So what do we do with this? And again, this is a couple months old at this point, but we look at the results. Um, we look for patterns, we look for trends, we look for what are our relative strengths and weaknesses. Certain types of writing, for example, we need to, to look at more carefully. Um, what are the impacts for this for our curriculum? And right now, we're beginning to say, how does this relate to what we know is going to be assessed as we move forward in the Common Core Standards for Literacy and Mathematics? And we'll begin to see that transition in next year's New England Common Assessment Program. Um, they'll be incorporating questions that are based on those new standards in the upcoming assessment. Um, a reminder, Maine has requested a No Child Left Behind waiver from the federal government with respect to annual adequate yearly progress. So. Um, districts that are not making AYP, and we have been found to have made AYP um, in all of our schools in all content areas in recent years. But if you haven't as a district, then um, right now the state is putting that on hold. And for us, one of uh, the pieces that are most linked to that are um, implementing the teacher and administrator evaluation system moving forward. That's one of the conditions that Maine has to prove that it's meeting um, in order to um, be granted a waiver. And as I mentioned earlier, the NECAP assessment it's last year is the upcoming year and it will be um, replaced by a smarter balance in a couple of years. So I want to talk just briefly um, about district report cards. So these were shared with the board um, and released by um, the commissioner and the governor couple of weeks ago now, it feels like it was a long time ago. Um, you know, the, Cape Elizabeth received A's um, for each of its schools and um, the report cards are based on not only proficiency measures like we just looked at, but they're also based on growth measures. And so, um, you know, for us, our growth um, for all students um, at the elementary school in mathematics was 84%, and for reading, it was 80%. So, again, that's really good news that the majority of our students are not only maintaining where they were, or where you would expect them to be year to year, because it's not really where they were, because we're assessing not the third grade level expectations each year, but now we're looking at the fourth grade level expectation. So they're achieving above where you would expect them to achieve moving forward. So they're making not just adequate growth, but they're stepping above that. I know it's a little confusing, but it's a, I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, it, the other piece that these, um, the district report cards looked at is the percentage uh, or performance of students in your lowest quartile. And again, for us, the, the groups um, that we identified, the cohort groups, are economically disadvantaged subgroup and our students with disabilities subgroup. And those students, many of those students, score in that lowest quartile. So the emphasis, again, um, not just for our district, but for all districts, is to really concentrate um, on supporting all of our students. You know, that's, that's our responsibility, is to make sure that all of our students are making the growth that we would expect, expect to see. 
That's it from me. Any questions for the superintendent? Um, okay. I have to okay. go ahead. I'm going to hit the Mary? We're on our second year of really concentrating, or into a, our second or third year of really concentrating on literacy as a goal for the district. Um, when would we expect to see um, sort of a bump in scores? It sounds like we had a little lax because of the writing, and, and there's been sort of a, a um, course correction in that regard. Mathematics, it looks like um, Falmouth is doing very well. I've heard that they've incorporated a STEM um, mm -hmm. curriculum at this point, and I know we're in the beginning stages of that, and we're looking towards that. I, I guess I'm wondering sort of what are, what, what's your vision for sure. sort of um, bolstering some of these scores right. and, so, and so supporting students? So first, the big the answer to the big question is it takes three to five years typically with any change that's implemented or at least that's the research base to begin to see a change. Um, and, and I think you can see changes at the classroom level if you're to walk into them today. But you also have to bear in mind that, okay, so Maine was working with the Maine learning results and then it adopted the New England Common Assessment Program, which really wasn't based on Maine standards, but they sort of cross-linked it to some of Maine standards, which was really a cost measure. Um, so the fact that our performance on that assessment wasn't as high as maybe it had been on the Maine learning results was no surprise to anyone. And so as we began to make that shift, then suddenly here came the common core assessments and by the way here are the new standards that you have to meet and achieve and we adopted Maine adopted those already so uh, we're already looking at what are the expectations for a common core and you know to be perfectly frank the, the New England common assessment addresses some of those but not all of those and really the purpose is to go deeper um, and and to help our students have uh, more depth of a greater depth of understanding and the uh, greater ability to communicate their understanding of concepts and information. Um, I anticipate that we are going to be seeing a steady improvement of our um, reading, reading performance, um, not just for all students, which I anticipate, not that we're ever going to be at 100%, um, I think that's unrealistic, um, but, but I think we're going to continue to see a steady performance because we have looked at what wasn't happening for students really systematically and analytically and we have put interventions in place globally um, at the elementary level in particular to address those gaps and to help students move forward. Um, the problem is we're going to be looking at a brand new assessment measure. So, so the, the, the work that we've done isn't going to show linearly because you're not going to be looking at, at the same uh, measure, but we have also our own local assessments that we conduct. So we're going to be able to say, geez, as we look back at our NWEA scores or at our DRA assessments, we can see that over time we've seen a steady uptick in student performance and in, on those measures as well. Um, so we're not limited by using just this tool, but, but this is the tool that the state and federal government look at um, to assess district performance. So it's, we're in flux and we're going to continue to be in flux, but I feel confident that our um, teachers and administrators are moving in the right direction with the work that we're doing um, in literacy in particular and in mathematics as we begin to take um, further steps into Common Core implementation that we're going to see the same kind of growth there over time. Other questions? No? Thank you. John, can I um, make a comment? Sure. About lit uh, since we're talking about literacy and growth, though, I think it's a when the three to five year gap, uh, the three to five year when you implement something and then you're you're looking to see the outcome three to five years that you said. I'm amazed by what we're doing not in the classroom, like sitting on the technology and then um, being in other meetings around the district, I'm amazed at how the teachers are 
and please correct me if I over, if I'm, this is my opinion, people are open to learning um, what they didn't know before. And having walk-ins in the classroom and having administrators, uh, our literacy people, our, um, the, the feeling is different than the last year. Poetry, uh, the poetry week, um, that in itself, teachers are opening up and saying, I want to bring poetry in, the kids are excited about it. The same with this literacy week, which was absolutely amazing. It's not just literacy that our scores go up, but it's more of the love of literature and how to communicate with people and show that I don't know this, um, a teacher saying, I don't know this, how can I learn it, coming to the book groups, coming to um, trainings. That's what I see happening, and I don't, is that what you're talking about when you say three to five years, we'll see? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think professional learning communities have certainly been a part of the work to sort of open up practice and um, to, um, I, I think, just help us all be more comfortable saying, geez, I'm not so good at that, but I bet it, you seem to be, do that really well. Can I watch you? Can I observe you? Um, and our building administrators have taken really thoughtful steps, I think, to um, help teachers and teacher leaders and department heads um, have been a part of this work as well, but encouraging those, those conversations and opening up that dialogue. Um, the, what I'm specifically um, talking about in the three to five year piece is that there's a pretty significant body of research that says when you're learning something new, you're not as skilled at it and some other things fall off because you're concentrating so hard on that new piece that you've learned that you forget that you were really a good teacher before and you did a lot of things terribly well. Um, and so you don't sort of gain your momentum and hit your full stride instructionally until really that third year, um, which is just about who we are as adult learners. And, um, and you see that with kids too. You don't master everything the first time you see it. It takes time. That's why uh, curricula like everyday math were developed because children's uh, learning opportunities sort of spiral. They're open to it at a certain window that developmentally they can absorb certain pieces of the information, but they may need to see it again and again. And so that same thing happens for us as adult learners. And so when we start doing something new in our classrooms or providing new instruction or introducing the STEM curricula or trying out this new literacy practice, we're going to be pretty good at it. But the second year, we're going to be better at it because we will have had the opportunity to have a conversation with our colleague or get some feedback from an administrator or a peer and from our students and to see how did this go. And by the third time we do it, we probably are doing it really well and successfully because we've incorporated now that feedback and, and that additional learning. And so that's when you really see changes take off for students. That's great. Well, thank you for doing and setting up the time for teachers to be able to um, get the learning and practice and ask other teachers to get better at the craft. Thank you. Are there other Item D. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, Moving right. So we had one letter of resignation uh, received from Mary Hart. Mary is a part-time art teacher at the high school who's been with the district for 20 years, and she is leaving um, us. She has the opportunity to be uh, on the faculty at Colby College, so we wish her well in that endeavor. Thank you. Item C. D E. Sorry, I'm not wearing my glasses. He's <laughs> coming after D. Put the scene. I'm not particular about alphabetical order, so it's okay. Um, so I want to start with um, sharing some information from Mortsol about the National Latin Exam. And there, um, that was an optional exam for students this year. And of the nine students who take it, took it this year, uh, six of them scored. Um, really highly and I just want to commend um, Natalie Vaughn who earned the silver maxima cum laude, McKenna Wood with a magna cum laude, Cole Carpenter with a magna cum laude, Jesse Mayo with a magna cum laude, Zoe Gillies with a cum laude and Jasper Hansel who is the sole Latin II student when Latin II meets voluntarily before school um, who received a cum laude. So congratulations to the <laughs> students and um, and to Mort for a job well done. 
tonight is the seventh and eighth grade band concert, so uh, Mr. Purley is not here with us, but he is there enjoying the concert and supporting those teachers and um, students and their families. Last week, as Kate mentioned, was Literacy Week, and it capped off on Saturday with um, the first, uh, maybe annual, I don't know, um, Author Fest, which had a really magnificent turnout, and the feedback was really positive, I think, not only from students and families who attended, but also from the authors and illustrated who attended and presented. Um, so I want to say thank you to the committee who helped put last week together. It was um, really a there, were, there was a wide range of offerings and um, a number of wonderful opportunities for students um, and teachers to learn from and interact with um, just wonderful professionals um, in the field of literacy and, and specifically and beyond. Yes, I just wanted to say I was lucky enough to be there as a volunteer reader on Thursday for the parade put on by the kindergartners and first graders. K-1 and 2. They, they paraded in their favorite book character through the entire Pond Cove and Middle School hallways. I did. It was adorable. It was a hit. It's a huge success. The whole school is obviously very ignited, so it was fun. Uh, it was an, equal, an equally large hit for the middle schoolers who had the opportunity to see them walk through, yeah. who actually, I, I heard some you know, seventh and eighth graders saying, can we get our picture taken with Clifford? <laughs> <laughs> who was Clifford? Who was Clifford? I Warm don't in there. know. <laughs> well done. Uh, juniors took their SATs on May 4th, and so again, um, congratulations to the high school on, and to those students who spent um, a full morning busily taking those exams, but that's also not a small feat to bring your entire junior class together and to proctor those exams, so thanks to the high school guidance office and the faculty who supported that work. Our sixth graders spent a week at Chewankee and um, had the most beautiful weather, I'm told, that they have ever had. Ever. So that was... Ever. <laughs> been reminded by my kids. Ever. That was um, a nice experience for them on the whole. Um, also at the middle school, sixth grader Ezra Smith, his doodle for Google design was chosen as the state runner-up. He wasn't the winner, but he was the state runner-up. And um, his piece was displayed online, but when I tried to find it yesterday, it's no longer there. So um, you might have to check with uh, Mrs. Lawler Rohner if you want to see that piece. Uh, on May 2nd, the High School uh, Parents Association, HOPE, and the high school jointly sponsored a forum for parents on substance abuse. And uh, I think that was an informational evening for those who were in attendance. And, um, some of that information has previously been posted online, but I'm sure if you would like more information, you can reach out to any of those groups and they would be happy to provide you with some. We have lots of events coming up as we move forward um, from end of year concerts. Uh, next Tuesday, it will be an all choral concert from grades four through 12. We're doing sort of a joint performance at the high school on Tuesday evening should be a fun experience, I think. On Thursday of next week, um, it's awards night for grades nine through 11 at the high school, and prior to that is a presentation from um, poster sophomore research presentations, um, excuse me, from five to 6.30. We have, as Mr. Mullen mentioned earlier, the high school spring show coming up at the end of the month, May 31st and June 1st, I believe, are the performance dates the high school band and choral concerts on June 4th and graduation, which will occur prior to our next meeting on June 9th. I was thinking it was the 8th, but I'm pretty sure it's the 9th. Um, Pond Cove celebrated Arts Day on May 2nd. Um, again, that was organized by the Pond Cove Parents Association. It was a huge success. There were 26 um, artisans who came in and I watched students uh, in the courtyard um, performing their karate kicks and um, there were students dancing in the hallways and lots of creative um, art projects that came home that day as well. Um, <laughs> some comments from Pond Cove about Cape Celebrates Literacy Week. 
Author illustrator Scott Nash presented to all K-4 students last Monday and Tuesday. The Main State Ballet performed page to, page to stage, excuse me, scenes from Alice in Wonderland for students um, last Wednesday and they performed for the middle school as well. Storybook character parade, as Joe previously mentioned, for students in K through four. And then um, on Thursday and Friday, storyteller Len Cabral was here as well performing for students. And I've heard um, lots of students sort of retelling or telling their own stories with a bit of a dramatic flair since then. So he had an impact as well. And then related to literacy, um, six teachers from Pond Cove um, and some middle school staff members as well, two middle school staff members just completed a year long literacy course where they've been working um, directly with students um, and participating in course, uh, a course every week after school. Um, they've been completing assignments and coming in before school to try out those instructional strategies with students. Um, it's been led by uh, Rosemary Ginn, who's a reading specialist at Pond Cove. But again, I think it's not only built sort of their instructional skills, but also built a nice network for um, faculty across the two schools. So, that's my list. Thank you. Any, are there any questions on the superintendent's report? Mary, um, you have to... Uh, I, I know you didn't put yourself in there for the amount of work that you did on um, the literacy committee. Um, I was able to get there maybe four nights, and you were there every night, including Friday and Saturday, all day Friday and Saturday. Um, the work is amazing. Thank you very much for everything you did. Um, the meetings I sat in, Meredith brought everybody together, heard their ideas. Um, championed them and let them run with it and was always there for guidance for how can I help I'm stumbling and then Meredith with their positive attitude would cheer them on to get to the next stage. Uh, the libraries involved, the all three schools were involved, IS regular ed. It was a very impressive group and uh, of course CIF was involved, of course. Just thank you for your work. Well, it was fun to do and really the committee did 99% of the legwork. Yeah. I, well. <laughs> I think you're being modest. <laughs> it was fun. And I, it was a positive experience overall. And, um, I think there were some great experiences for kids that came out of it. I, I only got to attend the, the Saturday um, event with the authors, but it, but it was a, just a phenomenal thing to be able to, to provide for um, not only students, but also um, adults who were there to, to, to speak with the authors, to listen to them read from their books, to, to hear students asking questions of authors about how they, about their process and how lo long it took and what work went into writing, writing these stories. I think it was, it was inspirational. Um, I will add, we thanked the authors at the end of the Author Fest for the dinner and the most consistent thing I heard from them was what thoughtful questions um, the students who attended had and that it was a really unique experience for most of them in that it was probably the most interactive and um, where they had heard the most questions from um, young people. So there, um, some of them are already asking me what the date is for next year, which is a good problem to have. <laughs> right. Okay, so moving on then to the new item, item 5F, that we added to the agenda, um, and I hope I'm not stealing any thunder from Mr. Shedd, who's got an awards presentation coming up by um, recognizing our student representatives tonight, Abby Donnelly and Nolan Morris. Um, these are two students who have given us a, a tremendous amount of time um, of their time this year on the, on the school board. Um, they have endured um, countless hours of, of uh, school board meetings patiently and they have, their contributions um, have been extremely valuable. We've, we've, um, we've dealt with a number of issues this year where student input was really important and, and the thoughtful um, comments that, that both of you have brought to our process has really, really um, meant a lot to the board and in, in our consideration of those issues. And um, so I want to thank you for that, for that service. And, um, and uh, you'll, you will be sorely missed. And um, we wish you the best of luck uh, next year. And I have a certificate to prove it. 
Okay, so new business, item 6A, consideration to approve the proposed 2013-2014 academic year calendar. May I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the 2013-14 academic year calendar as presented. Second? Second. Okay, are there any comments? As Meredith, presented you like here. To, it's in your packet. Right. So the draft, should include that. the draft of this calendar was, I think, shared with the board in January, is my recollection. As you'll recall, due to a legislative change last year, we have to have no more than five dissimilar days in the districts that comprise the local regional educational um, center, excuse me, which for us has the uh, Portland Area Technology High School. Portland adopted their calendar um, at long last on April 23rd. So. Here is our calendar, which complies with the five-day um, requirement. Wow. Okay. And for those watching who can't see this at home, it is basically a, a similar calendar to this year's with a February and April vacation. Although we um, have heard that Portland is exploring the possibility of a single um, vacation in March for the upcoming school year, so that would have um, an impact for us and would certainly be something we would need to talk about in the upcoming year. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Okay. Uh, B, consideration to appoint representative to the Community Services Advisory Commission. May I have a motion? I move that we appoint the representatives to the Student Advisory Committee. And there's no list of advisory commission. There's no list of. I'm sorry, did one pass it? No, well, you Community asked for services a motion, but it may be easier for her to make a motion if you want to make a nomination of the oh, members okay. first. Oh, okay. Well, I can. All right. I will nominate. Um, we had, we've had um, applications from, from some terrific community members, um, including Trish Brigham, uh, Sarah McCall, and Debbie Butterworth. Okay. Thank you. So I move that we appoint Patricia, Br Patricia Bigham. Brigham. Brigham, Sarah McCall, and Debbie Butterworth as representatives to the Community Services Advisory Commission. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Just that we're extremely lucky to have such talented and involved um, community members offering to, to be part of the Community Services Advisory Board. It's, um, I was very impressed with the applications. I think it'll be a very strong committee. Um, I, well, I would second that and I note that there, there are, I think there are important community issues in front of the mm -hmm. in front of community services this year. We, we, we learned a little bit about um, one of those in the fitness center and, and um, I'm glad to have among these folks um, some, some of the people who, who um, had expressed um, uh, their passion for the fitness center. So. Um, we know that there's, there's people in this group who care about um, that facility and, and finding ways to make that work going forward. So um, I appreciate the applications from each of these three as well. Yes? Just one note for the record that um, there are different term lengths for these individuals. So um, Trish Brigham and Sarah McCall um, will be fulfilling terms from 2013 to 2015. Those are new new terms that were um, vacated at the beginning of the year, and Debbie Betterworth will be fulfilling a term that expires at the end of this calendar year that was vacated by a resignation from the committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. Item C, approval of athletic extracurricular staff nominations. May I have a motion? Yes, I move we approve the athletic extracurricular staff nominations as listed in the board packet. And um, they are four uh, positions for JV uh, and varsity baseball and one position for girls lacrosse. Second. I'll second. Elizabeth. 
Uh, any comments or discussion? All those in favor? Item D, um, policies for second reading. Okay, well, I move that we approve the following policies for second reading as listed in item 6D in today's packet. And, and I guess uh, items for deletion as well. Yes. Most importantly. Most yes. importantly, <laughs> since our, our charge was to thin the policy manual. I'd like that. Yes. I'll second that. <laughs> um, a second? You seconded. Any discussion on these policies? Okay. All those in favor? Sorry. Item E. Um, this is a first read and there won't be a vote. So, Joe, do you want to make Sure. Um, well, I would just like us to consider for a first reading. Um, the policies that are listed in item 6E in today's packet. This is a first reading. There's no final vote. This is being basically put out to the community for those who have any comments that they'd wish to share or comments that they wish to make on any of these policies, <clears throat> that they do so in writing to either Meredith or I prior to our next policy meeting, which would be the first Monday of June. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, I'd like to point out there is a list of recommended policies also for deletion under item 6E. Thank you. Uh, item F, this was the item I was looking for when Mr. Chairman was mentioning the schedule, um, and now I see why I didn't see it because there's <laughs> formatting is different. Yes, but. the formatting is different. Um, as he explained, there is um, a requirement to submit the technology plan to the Department of Education um, by May 25th. That does not mean that they will necessarily accept it on sort of first pass. They sometimes will say, we like these pieces, please address these, please make these changes. Um, so what we need from you really is um, authorization to allow the chair and the superintendent to um, sign off on the district technology plan um, as approved. May I have a motion? Sure, I move that we authorize the chair and the superintendent to author or to uh, authorize the Cape Elizabeth School District's technology plan for 2014 through 2017. Second? Second. Any discussion? David? Yeah, I, I will vote in favor, but I have a slight um, problem with the fact that the technology plan was sort of summarized on, a, on the wall, and I have not seen it in writing, so I'm approving something I haven't seen 95% of, but I'm doing it in reliance on the excellent committee and so forth. But in the future, I, if I'm going to be asked to vote on the plan, I'd like to see it in writing ahead of time so I can read it. Um, and I certainly appreciate that. There was a change this year legislatively. It, calls for the plan to be submitted to the Department of Education prior to June 30th, and um, the committee received word that the plan had to be submitted by May 25th. Um, so they hadn't necessarily intended to bring it to this meeting. The real intent was to have brought it to the subsequent meeting, and they had been finalizing the work um, on the plan as late as last week. So I certainly understand the circumstances. Well, I, I figured there was something like that. Um, some number of years ago, I wouldn't have done something on faith. This year, I will. But, and it's because of you and the people that were on that committee. You being Meredith for the. If, um, if people, when they, when they have more time to spend with the technology plan, if they have uh, questions or comments, um, of course, those can be brought to, the, to, to, to Meredith or, or to Mr. Kramer. Does it have to have school board approval? I mean, do we have to approve the plan or do we, can we just approve that you can su submit the plan? That's right. Right now we're just asking for you to approve that we submit the plan. Okay. And then once we have um, an okay from the state, we'll bring it back to you for final approval. Okay, so can we change the wording then of the motion? Because the motion says consideration to approve 
the district um, technology that's plan. Michael, that's not what Michael read. Oh. Joe. Michael. I'll remove my last one and say uh, I move that we approve, uh, I move that we authorize the superintendent and school board chair to submit the Cape Elizabeth School District's technology plan to the required state committee or agency for the 2014-2017 school year. That's fine. You need a second for that? Okay. Yeah. I'll second it. Okay. A second. Any further discussion? Well, just one quick question. Uh, does that mean that even though you're submitting it, we, we can, we're going to get a, a version later and we can change it after you've submitted it? If necessary. If, exactly, if need be. Well, I don't believe in changing something if it's not necessary. So <laughs> my point is, we, we, we have. Can I have, what time is it? <laughs> well, I, I, think I, I understand your point, David. Basically, we're submitting. I'm this not sure I understand the, that crack, but I'll remember it. <laughs> Basically, we're understand we're submitting this as what we yeah, believe is a, yeah. a workable draft um, that we may receive some feedback from the state on that suggests we make changes in a particular uh, on particular areas, and that we would incorporate those changes into that draft and bring them back to you for final approval. If there are changes beyond. Um, that that the board feels are important, then we would resubmit it to the state for approval a second time. Okay, that's a fairly bizarre procedure, but if I, we're just trying to get the, the first link in the chain by submitting it, correct. but if we can submit it again, if we think this changes. That's correct. We can okay. amend the plan at any time, actually, between, during the three Fine. years, but to meet the timeline. And I'm less concerned that I have read everything that I'm approving. Uh, all those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, item seven, committee reports. Do we have any committee chairs who would care to make a report at this point at nine o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> All right, item eight, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for new agenda items for future meetings? Seeing none, we move on to item nine, announcement of upcoming meetings. Again, I'd just like to, oh, I'm sorry. It's nine o'clock. Again, I would just like to announce our next policy meeting is Monday, June 9th, June 3rd. Um, and a list of the policies that we'll, we, we, we will be reviewing in that meeting will be on our website. And I suggest if anyone has a comments or concerns to get those to us prior. Um, so, and I wanted to say to the board that we've, we've put on the schedule for June 11th um, an executive session to discuss the evaluation of the superintendent. That's one of the most important jobs that the board does every year. And, um, so that, I just wanted that to be on your schedule. That's an, that would be the night of our June regular business meeting. So it just means we'll, we'll start a little bit earlier that night. Um, so we have time to do that in advance of the meeting if that works with everybody. Are, are we going to have materials in advance to look at? Yes. I believe that's scheduled for May 28th. So you'll receive that information at or prior to the workshop on the 28th. Thank you. And, and, yeah, so it, the process will work as, as it has in the past. Um, the superintendent will do a self-evaluation. Self we'll receive that on May 28th. And then we'll have time to put together our evaluation and assemble it in, in advance of our June um, 11th meeting so we can meet at that time to discuss it. Thank you. Um, and do, the meetings that are scheduled for the 15th, and the 18th, are those yeah. worth Sure. Um, informational meetings for parents of incoming kindergartners are scheduled for tomorrow night, the 15th, um, at 7 o'clock here in the Thomas Jordan Conference Room, and also um, on Saturday, the 18th. I'm Saturday, the 18th, at 9 o'clock. Um, at 9 a.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. And can you just clarify the, the distinction between an informational meeting for incoming 
kindergarten parent and a, and a kindergarten orientation meeting, which this is not. Sure. I mean, this really is an opportunity for parents to ask questions and better understand um, the process as it moves forward. Orientation is more typically an experience where you're meeting with your child's teacher to have the opportunity to understand what's happening in that particular classroom and all the ins and outs of um, the, the day-to-day -day routines that occur um, in a specific classroom. And so, and the orientations will occur what, later in the summer? Is that's that a, that's, that's a, the typically plan. Typically in August? Yep, thing? they're typically okay. um, held later in the year. Okay. David? I, I just want to note, um, whoever's actually watching this, that there is a, an extent, two extensive letters on our website, one explaining the board's rationale for the approach we're taking, and one is Meredith's excellent question and answer of, with a lot of uh, answers to how this program we hope will be implemented, um, which people can look at prior to these meetings. Hmm. But they should look at our website in case they haven't received them already. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, That moves us on to item 10. May I have a motion to adjourn? Move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Second. Okay. Thank you all. She motion.